Pete, it's a pleasure to, to be virtually uh, with you today. And um, yeah, we'll talk about how combining observation of the cosmic microwave background with surveys of the large scale structure is a great opportunity to learn about galaxy evolution and, uh, and cosmology. And the results that uh, I'll present today are part of the latest Atacama Cosmology Telescope uh, data release. And I want to especially acknowledge the contribution of my close collaborators, Nick Battaglia, and Emily Moser from Cornell, Emmanuel Chan, Simone Ferraro from Berkeley, and all the ACT team. And yeah, this presentation is based on these two papers that are posted on the archive and are accepted for publication in a physical review. Uh, this is the outline of my talk. So I will talk about our observables, the kinematic and thermal Sunyaid Zeldovich effect and how they, uh, we can use them to probe baryon profile in the, in, in the circumgalactic medium or intergalactic medium, and uh, how we can detect using a combination of CMB observation and galaxy surveys. I will show results from ACT, uh, uh, DR5 uh, uh, and Planck for uh, a sample from BOSS, from BOSS galaxies, and what are the prospects for, for the future. I, Okay, so uh, I'd like to start with the motivation of, of, of this project. Uh, the motivation is we, we are looking for baryons because they are interesting. They, they, the, the baryonic physics is uh, important to understand the evolution of structure in the universe. And an example of, of this, I've put here some uh, snapshots from the illustrious uh, simulations on the on the left, you have the dark matter um, only uh, simulation and then the gas uh, and the gas with feedback. And you can see that in the place, in the nodes of this net when, where structure form, there's a, there's a difference between the simulation dark matter only and with gas. And uh, we can see by eye that uh, the simulations with gas, the structure in, in the simulations with gas, the, these nodes are more extended. And this is due to some baryonic processes, as mainly by feedback that pushes the, ga the gas uh, outside. Um, so, and for this reason, we see these um, more extended structures. Now, when the gas is pushed outside, the, it becomes more uh, faint. Uh, it becomes fainter, and it's harder to detect, especially for the lower mass halos, and especially at high redshift. So the uh, first point is we we look for uh, means for localize this gas, and the ability to to probe to characterize it is important uh, because the the baryonic physics is a large uncertainty in uh, matter power spectrum on small scale and we can see on the on the bottom plot uh, that's a simula a collection of different simulations where the baryonic physics is implemented in different ways and the scatter between these curves gives uh, an idea of the uh, uncertainties that is related to the uh, matter power spectrum. This is the lensing power spectrum. And we are comparing all these different profiles with, uh, with that of uh, that corresponds to a, an y axis zero to that of the dark matter only. And on the scales of this is as a function of uh, uh, multiples L and on the scales of around one, uh, 1000 to, to, to uh, a bit more, the 2000, highlighted by this vertical line is the scale of the clusters that we, we, we can, we can uh, probe uh, with our observations and we are interested in. So a reminder of what our observables are, the kinematic and thermal Sunyaid-Zadovich effects we we can we can observe so the, these effects uh, depend on uh, the interaction of the photons of the cosmic microwave background with the ionized gas associated with some halos. This can be massive galaxies or galaxy groups or galaxy clusters. So if we look if we have a map of the CMB uh, and we observe 
we observe that with the with the telescope in our case it's the atacama cosmology telescope on the ground but the same principle is for sky um, telescopes space telescopes they when when we observe the cmb photons uh, if they interact with the ionized gas associated with a with a with a halo the energy of the CMB photons will change as a consequence of these interactions. And we have two main effects that are consequence of these interaction. So one is the kinematic uh, SZ, that is due to the fact that the, the, ele the free electrons as have a bulk of velocity, a bulk motion with respect to the CMB rest frame. And so we can measure the difference in temperature on the CMB map that depends on uh, the amount of photons that are bounced off. And this is proportional to the optical depth to Thomson scattering, this tau, to the bulk velocity. And, and this, is, this effect is linearly dependent on the electron density and therefore on the gas density. Another effect uh, is the thermal. I see. Uh, and it's due to the fact that the free electrons have a thermal motion. And this is an effect that depends on the frequency, on the optical depth, and on the square of the, of the thermal velocity of the, of the electrons. So this is proportional to the density and the temperature of, of the electron. And so if we have a way to probe the kinematic SZ, we can uh, to measure the kinematic SZ, we can probe the gas density. If we can uh, measure the thermal SZ, we can probe the thermal energy of the gas or, uh, or the pressure. And an interesting feature of, of these probes is that we they, they are especially suited to study low density regions. Uh, so we have that the kinematic SZ is linearly proportional to, to the density. As the, for example, compared to uh, the X-ray probes that also probe the gas, uh, uh, the intracluster gas, but in that case, the X-ray surface brightness is proportional to the square of the gas density. So, in the, we, we, with the with the KSZ, we can uh, we can actually study lower mass halos with respect to what it's possible to do with the, with the X-rays. And then these effects are independent on redshift, so we can um, we can observe higher uh, uh, distance objects. And act, and what we do is to we, we consider a sample of galaxy from the BOSS uh, survey and specifically a subsample of that that's called CMAS. And you can see in the top left panel the overlap between the survey, this, this spectroscopic survey BOSS in red, and the overlap with the region observed by ACT in green. So the overlap gives us around 400,000 objects. And the galaxies in this catalog are mainly central galaxies of groups with the virial mass of around 10 to the 13 solar masses, and they are at a redshift between 0.4 and, and 0.7. And then we have the other, so we have here the two main ingredients of our, of our research a CMB map on the background. And for that, we have a combination of ACT and Planck from, uh, from the DR5 by NICE et al. 2020 in the two frequency band, 150 and 98 gigahertz. And, and uh, also we have a, a spectroscopic sample BOSS. And from that, uh, we can measure the KSZ and the TSZ stacking the uh, signal on the CMB temperature maps at the position of the galaxies in the sample and applying an aperture photometry filter to extract the signal. So we will measure at 150 and 98 gigahertz the thermal SZ as a temperature decrement. And this includes, has an important contamination um, that's the dust thermal emission. And I will... Um, I hope I have time to talk about this later. And for detecting the KSZ, 
we use a method that we call velocity reconstruction. And uh, basically, uh, we, can, we, we don't just measure the, the, the temperature on this map, but we weight all the measurements according to the velocity of the galaxies. This, this is because uh, to, to ensure that we measure the, the, the signal from correlated galaxies at, uh, at, at the redshift uh, of interest. And, and that, as we see, the, the KSZ depends on the bulk velocity. So we, I think this is all I wanted to say about that. And I have a summary. Oh yes, so uh, so following the stacking on all the position of uh, of the of these galaxies, we have a map for the KSZ for the TSZ with all the stacked signal. And here is a summary of the of the measurement at 150 gigahertz. And uh, you can see here this is a square of 15 arc minutes and. Uh, you can see the, the the signal at the center at the center of this map. This is the KSZ. Then in the middle we have the TSZ, uh, where we have used maps from uh, Maravacchi Rao, where the dust contamination was uh, projected. And on the right, the instead the TSZ that in, uh, that contains also the dust contamination that you can see as a uh, in fact. We, we, we know that this is a, a decrement temperature that we see as darker for, um, blobs uh, in the map. And the dust contamination is, we see an important fact, uh, yeah, an important systematics to account for. And, and it's visible in this map as a bright spot in the center. And uh, to have an idea of the scales involved here and why these observables are opening a new window into, a new window into the baryonic physics studies, we, we can see, I hope you can see here, uh, there are two circles per, per map. The inner one is the resolution of the telescope or the beam, and the outer circle is the virial radius. So, and and um, so, so what we are doing here is uh, we are observing the gas density and pressure at the virial radius and outside around galaxy groups. Uh, a nice comparison, I think, is this: if we if we look at the image observed uh, of one of the galaxies in our sample, as it is also observed by Hubble, uh, we have this image that uh, you can see here, this is the I band and uh, the, the side here is 15 arc seconds. So 15 arc second compared to 15 arc minutes. And the, the, the optical image would stay in the very, very central, um, just in the central pixel of, of our SE map. So told you that we extract the signal and we use an aperture photometry filter. If we vary the sides of the filter using increasing uh, radial, we can build a profile, a radial profile. So this is what uh, we have. And uh, you can see that in, at the two frequencies, the, the two profiles uh, with, the, with, solid, with the data and, uh, and, and, and this is uh, fit um, to, to the data. We have, a, a, th this profile ranges uh, between, uh, this is the virial radius. So we have until three, three, four virial radii. Uh, we are going out uh, to four virial radii. And one, one very interesting result from, uh, from this measurement is that, oh, okay, first of all, I, I, I want to highlight that this is a six to eight sigma detection that's very high and it's probably the highest to date for, for this kind of, of scales. And an interesting result is that uh, if we compare our measured KSD profile to a, a Navarro Frank and White for a, a sample of, of halos of, of the same uh, with the same mass distribution as our uh, as our sample, what we will get is uh, are those uh, dashed lines here. And so this this really tells us tell us that a, Navarro, a simple Navarro Franklin White is not cannot be a good description of the of the density of the of the gas density, and that the gas is more extended than the dark matter. 
and uh, and 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 we can imagine. Uh, I mean, we that the disease the disease due to this is the result of all the baryonic processes that are uh, involved in. Uh, um, in, 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 the, in the galaxy evolution. So feedback, star formation, accretion. Yeah, I've, I've, I've listed some of them here. Now, what, what we want to do is to, uh, so these are the data. We would like to be able to constrain models of, um, of our profiles so that we can, we can, we would like to constrain models where we can understand what are these uh, baryonic processes and uh, um, what what can we get from, from these observations. So to do so, we have implemented a, a pipeline that let us go from models to observations. And this is called MOPCGT, Model to Observable Projection Code for Galaxy Thermodynamics, that basically uh, takes some theoretical profiles for the gas uh, density and the, and uh, and the pressure we include in the model uh, also the two halo terms so that the the contribution of neighboring halo I'm not I'm not going into the details of this but um, uh, we so taking a 3d theoretical profile we project it on the line of sight we convolve uh, with the beam of, of the uh, of the instrument. And we apply um, in our pipeline the same aperture photometry filtering that was applied uh, to, the, to, the observed, to the observed data. And we end up with, uh, with some models, but in the observable space. So with our models, then we can compare directly um, with, with our projected models. Um, we can uh, compare them with, with the data and we can fit them to the data and um, and extract the, the information that, that, that we want. So I did the, 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 the model, the results that I want to that I want to show you are related to a, a model that we call OBB. That's uh, from the original um, paper that proposed it was Stryker, Bode and Babel, uh, 2005. Uh, I don't want to scare you with all this uh, formula. Uh, this is just to, to have an idea of, of how the model is implemented in the code. But what we are interested in are those three parameters that I've highlighted on the right. Uh, the polytropic index that describes how the gas density and, um, and the pressure are, are, are related. The, um, we consider that the, the total pressure is a, a, com a, a sum of a thermal and a non-thermal component. And we want to know how much the non-thermal uh, component is. And then uh, the uh, efficiency of the feedback. And, and we model it with this parameter epsilon. And I'll, I'll just jump to the results. So you can see the, the results of the, of, of the fit for the KSZ and the TSZ. Um, we fit jointly the two, frequ the, the, uh, the two frequency bands and, and the KSZ and the TSZ, including, including the dust. But now I'm just showing you the, the parameters of, of, the, uh, of the model that I presented you uh, before. And so we can constrain the amount of non-thermal pressure, we can put an upper limit on the amount of non-thermal pressure as 20% maximum within the virial radius of, of, of the total pressure is, uh, is non-thermal. And, uh, and then we can constrain the efficiency, the, uh, the feedback through this parameter epsilon. And this tells us that the, if we, if we, um, compute the energy injected by feedback compared to the total binding energy of the system, the energy injected by feedback is 30%. That's that's pretty um, high amount. I'll move on because if you remember uh, the equations for the thermal and, and kinematic SZ, so basically if we, if we compute the ratio between the two, we can we can have the electron the profile of the electron temperature and this is 
uh, what we get uh, by from from our uh, from our feet. So the virial radius here is at approximately two arc minutes for for this for for this sample uh, at our red, uh, typical redshift. And so what's interesting and uh, and and I repeat now again is that uh, instead of measuring just one single value of temperature the dashed line here is the is the the the, temp the virial temperature of an isothermal sphere with uh, with a with a mass of, uh, of, of with the with an average mass of our uh, halos uh, instead of having one single value we can have we, we we've actually measured a profile and this profile goes beyond the virial radius and it's for group sized halos so so this is very this is very promising um now once we have we this measurement of thermodynamic profiles have showed you guys density pressure and temperature beyond the virial radius we have a new observational window into the properties of the uh, cgm of the uh, circumgalactic medium and this has an impact both on galaxy formation and cosmology so i'll show you quickly this uh, nice comparison to some of the hydrodynamical simulations that that are available in the literature and uh, we have here uh, density and, and pressure and our result is the blue um, that, that that derives from uh, from uh, from SZ measurement is the blue is the blue line uh, with the two sigma uh, range while the other the colored uh, curves are from uh, uh, different sets of simulations um, of illustrious TNG uh, another set of simulation from Bataille et al and uh, for the gas density we compare also with the Navarro Franco white we, we've already seen the um, we already discussed the comparison with the Navarro Franco white profile and and we again see that uh, this is unsuitable to describe um, the, the gas density and um, on the right while we have the same comparison but for the thermal pressure so uh, and in striking I mean so something very interesting to observe here is that uh, in the range that we can probe with our observation that is indicated with these two vertical lines the uh, the simulations, all the simulations under predict the thermal pressure. And while for density, also they under predict the density, but if we, I mean, if we are within the range, we can, uh, we can infer that, that they are fairly consistent. So I'll focus on the thermal pressure. So there must be a reason, we, we are looking for the reason why this is happening. And one thing to consider is that way the feedback is implemented in hydrodynamical simulations. Each simulation gives some, uh, has some recipe to do that. And you, so they, they uh, in jargon, we say that uh, they introduce some subgrid feedback models that are clearly not uh, reproducing what we observe. So reproducing uh, including the feedback in, in, in these hydrodynamical simulations on, on these scales is quite challenging. So for some reason, and we are um, investigating that with analyzing uh, new sets of simulations, um, they are not introducing enough feedback or the energy of the feedback is not high enough or is not pushing the gas outside enough. We, we look forward new tests, but we hope that with these observations that we can give for the first time, we, we can offer a, a way to refine these models for simulations. And I will skip this slide because I want to talk about uh, the impact that our results has on the uh, galaxy, galaxy lensing, in mo more general on the matter power spectrum on small scale. This is another Another plot similar to the first one that I that I that I showed you, that illustrates how different simulations predict uh, a different power spectrum 
uh, at, in, at the nonlinear scales. We, we see them in terms of, of scales k. We, we have looked at the previous plot uh, as a function of the L, but this is the same thing. Um, and tells us that baryons do not trace the dark matter because as, as we've already, I mean, as we've said, the baryonic physics is much richer than dark matter. So we have observation of the CMAS sample and uh, there are optical weak lensing observations of the same sample. And uh, in 2017, a paper by Lotho et al. studied, measured the galaxy galaxy lensing signal in terms of uh, surface mass density sigma, delta, this delta sigma, and, and compare it for, with comparing it to theoretical models, they noted a, a gap, a discrepancy between models and, and uh, observations. And they concluded that the lensing signal is low for some reason. What, what, what we try to do is to introduce our measurements of the gas density through uh, the KSZ and uh, into this modeling in a simple way, instead of in considering that the baryons followed at, at the, have the same profiles as the dark matter, uh, of course, decreased by the, the baryon fraction, we, we separate the, the surface mass density in two thirds dark matter term and a baryon term. When for the baryon, we consider our, we, we introduce our um, KSZ measurements projected um, into dimensions. And uh, here's, here's an updated plot of the uh, Lotho et al. paper, uh, where we have again in green their data and in red is the original model it's the model that they considered from site at all 2017. And our uh, update is what you see in blue. Again, our observational range is, is within the, the, the vertical lines, while what's outside is, is extrapolated. And, and we assume that at the uh, here, uh, in, in this point that I'm um, indicating with the, with the pointer, that's the outermost radii that we, radius that we can, that we observe. Uh, we assume that here, delta sigma is equal to delta sigma dark matter. So as you can see, when we include our um, gas density model, the, the gap is reduced by half approximately. But, but we are not yet on the data. So another interesting question is to, is to understand what shall we put in, in our models so that we, we, fairly reproduce, we, we, can, we can fairly reproduce uh, the data. So there's a, probably a combination of many effects that, that we need to understand. And uh, I, I would like to, to stop uh, here. Uh, with a, a summary of what we've seen. So we've seen how this KSZ and TSZ uh, measurement um, open a new observational window in the uh, properties of, uh, of the uh, variance in low density environments. We've applied, we've, we, we've used them to, to study the gas associated with a group of galaxies. In a, in a radial range that uh, is also quite uh, unexplored well, so far. And we can, with that constraint feedback, non-thermal pressure, temperature, offer a test for hydrodynamical simulation. And also we have studied the impact on, uh, on the modeling of galaxy-galaxy lensing. We expect a huge improvement that will come from new uh, surveys of the large scale structure and also from future CMB experiments. So the signal to the, the, the measurements that we have today will the, 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 the significance of that of those measurements uh, will grow greatly in uh, in a few years. So we've seen that we have now measurements of six, eight, sigma, we, we expect to improve this number by a lot. And this, this will have the consequence of giving, if we have 
basically smaller error bars of our measurement, the constraints that we can get on the feedback, on the non-thermal pressure, on the temperature profile will be, will be much, much tighter. And also improving the data will uh, let us uh, make this study for subsamples in mass in galaxy properties. For example, we can study that from blue versus red galaxies or make some sample of redshift, etc. So we are very excited to, uh, to pursue the studies uh, with cross correlation of uh, CMB and large scale structure. And we look forward uh, for new exciting results. I can stop here and, and I'm happy to take questions. I think it's a good time. I don't know. Yeah. Um, okay. I also have a question. Yes, uh, you can go ahead. Okay. So uh, first of all, thank you for a very nice talk. Um, so uh, first of all, just a comment. Uh, it seems from your results that uh, the NFW profile for the pressure of the gas is now completely ruled out which is quite a, a big deal because it was uh, the core of previous parameterization of the uh, gas pressure in clusters. I'm, I'm thinking, for example, about the uh, our node profile, universal pressure profile from 2010. They, all these profiles, they heavily use the NFW in the core, but uh, from the plots, it seems that uh, the prediction is completely off uh, compared to the, to the latest results. Uh, so is yeah, it yeah, it definitely is. So no, no, it, it's. Um, it, I, I think we, yeah, we should also uh, look at the um, uh, at the at the mass that with the, of the yeah of the sample that we are considering. So this is a uh, these are groups of like ten to the thirteen solar masses. The the Arno profile was um, uh, of class more massive clusters. So um we may expect that the this this baryonic processes are more important at low masses um and uh so for sure the navarro frank and white cannot cannot describe uh the intracluster uh gas we have to see at what scale so for mm. in, in our case yes it is completely ruled out um mm. at least it's, it's not universal cluster. sorry it's sorry it's not universal anymore i mean it's not that <laughs> sure. universal. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. yes it is um yeah i i have to so i apologize i haven't updated the plot here yeah we actually have in in the in the updated version of the paper we have included the Planck profile, it's not exactly the same of the Arnaud, mm -hmm. but it's, it, it comes from there. So in our paper, yeah, you can go and see, uh, uh, we've included in, in this plot the Planck profile and it's, it's for, for, for the pressure. And it, it, it's uh, like similar to the, to the other curves, it, it under predicts the pressure as well. Uh, when, you say the, when you say the Planck uh, profile, do you mean the best fitting value of the uh, of the universal pressure profile by Planck data the, yeah. the okay i see yeah i mean the Planck 2013 yeah yeah okay i know what you mean yeah okay uh, thank you and um, uh, another quick question that i had if uh, is if, if you could go could go back to the one of the first slides where you were showing how you build your uh, KZ profile. Um, so I, I didn't understand the procedure. Uh, so you have your your um, uh, Z and CMB maps from Planck and uh, ACT, and you have your CMAS clusters. And uh, uh, so then you were showing some apertures, different apertures, and that was the process to build the. Uh, the pro yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, just if you could, uh, I got a bit lost here. So just if you could. Uh... Oh, no, right. I, I I went too fast probably. So the so we we have the pos the location of the of the galaxies on the sky, and this is actually three D information because we have the location and the redshift, and this is important for the KSZ because 
the KSC is basically the signal, um, it's the line of sight momentum, right? It's the, yeah, density times um, velocity. So we we need the, the redshift information. We we have in our case, a spec, we have redshift from, from uh, spectra. It, it would work uh, as well with the uh, with, with photometric redshift. But the important thing is that we have, we can put uh, our galaxies in a, in a 3D space where we know location and redshift. And from there, we can, if we have the, the, the mass over density, we can translate it through some uh, theory in, in linear theory, we can translate it to a velocity over density and, and I have the, the velocities of the, of the galaxies. Now, so this is how we get to the KSZ for building the profile. For building a profile, we apply, so we go at the location of the galaxy and we put a, a, a circle of one arc minute and measure the signal there. And then we, this is what is called aperture photometry. Uh, when, we, when we measure the signal and then we apply a, a filter so that the signal is, the filter is one in one arc minute, is minus one in, in this external uh, blue ring. This external blue ring has the same area as the inner uh, brown, and we subtract the signal there. This is to, uh, yeah, subtract the background. Um, so it's a signal of the disk minus signal of the ring. Okay. And, and the filter works, so plus one in the disk, minus one in the ring, and zero elsewhere. So this is the, the so-called compensated aperture photometry. And we measure this, so disk minus ring at one arc minute, then uh, 1.7, 2 point something, and until, until six arc minutes. I hope it's more clear, but, but in any but case, sure. These points are the average of these uh, values uh, centering the, the aperture on all the galaxies? Yes, exactly, okay. exactly. Okay, yes. okay. Yeah, it's clear, okay, thank you. Thank you, and, and all the details of, of the measurements are in the Shan et al. Uh, you, you can find it on archive. Sure, uh, thank you. One of these two, I don't remember which one. Okay, okay. <laughs> thank you. I'm from Hong Kong, yeah. Uh, so the question is, so to what extent can this work account for the missing baryon problem? Yeah, this is, a, this is a very interesting question. So first of all, the, yeah, it depends on what, 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 what one mean, what, what's the problem that people see in this missing baryon. So is, the problem is we don't see the baryons. We've seen, yeah, I can, I can, I can refer to this plot. We've seen how many baryons are within one virial radius, and, and we've seen that most of them are outside. So this is a hint that for the missing baryon, we have to look out in the outskirts of, of Halos, and we would find. Oh. Uh -huh. So, so uh, Stephanie, may, may I just uh, uh, elaborate a bit? I think the uh, the missing baron, the crucial thing for missing baron is whether we can find those four point eight percent of the baron, which whether we can count them as the value measured by the CMB. So um, now we see from the result that the baron certainly distribute differently with the dark measure. So the question is, can we reconstruct the baron fraction from some way? that it can recover the mean value measured by the CMB. Would that be a fair question to ask? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think we can, if we integrate the, 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 this, this, this measurement, we can have, yeah, we have the number density of the electrons um, and, and, and we can tell how, what, what, what this number is within, uh, yeah, within a certain radius. I, I don't, I don't have, we haven't made this calculation. Uh, yeah, so all I mean is that uh, 
somehow if one can integrate that electron fraction, as you said, and to recover the baryon density, and then compare maybe uh, with uh, either dark matter density or, or just itself, that if we can demonstrate the fraction is correct, the fraction of that, that baryon with respect to the critical density of the universe or with respect to the total measure of the universe is what is measured by the, uh, by the CMB, that then, then this problem is solved, isn't it? That's that. That's a really good point. Yes, and we haven't done it. <laughs> but okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. All right. So I have um, eight questions. Oh uh, uh, sorry for that. <laughs> I, I okay. I, I just hit. Okay, here we only have a, a few minutes. I think we, uh, so we, I can just uh, take one or two important questions and do, uh, uh, to ask. I think the critical, one of the critical questions I have is uh, if you just uh, flip to the previous page of combining the act, yeah, okay. Combining the act map with Planck map, then I'm a bit worried, uh, worrying that the, uh, Plunk resolution is just uh, not good enough so that the combine would be able to sacrifice the very good data from ACT. Yeah. Um, so in this, um, in this combination, I, I, I can tell you the, the final resolution of the ACT plus Plunk. And for, for the 150 gigahertz, it's uh, around 1.3 arc minutes. And, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know all the details of, of how the uh, how this combination was optimized. Uh, this is in uh, nice nice at all, uh, but yeah, the resolution of this act plus Planck is one one point three one point four arc minutes. Okay, and, but and, Planck, Planck really have uh, Planck was Planck right. really have five. Yes, yes. Planck really have like five arc minutes large. Uh, how can how come that become true? <laughs> how come you kind of decrease it so that it so just become a better day? So I stick my nose in. It's 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 just it's a weighted combination of the act and the plank maps, right? So this is in Sigurd's paper, which Stefan has just mentioned. Yeah, it's this. Uh, you basically get an act resolution on small scales. You get in plank resolution on large scales because that that's all. Yeah, it's it's not a problem. Okay. Okay. I see. I see. Okay. And the other thing is, uh, when you when you talk about the um, uh, aperture photometry method, the next slide. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, there's an aperture oh, photometry yes. method. Yes. 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 Okay. So I understand that you average the signal in the ring so that it can represent the Cauchy mean value and then subtract it from the center circle right so i wonder uh, how, how do you decide how, how do you decide the size of the ring uh, which is the thickness of the ring so that I make it an uh, unbiased estimate of the signal i don't know what the correct answer is um Be because you don't want to subtract too much nor too little isn't it <laughs> Yeah, I think the uh, upper limit, there's a noise. Uh, I mean, if you, there's a trade off between getting yeah, an unbiased signal in one direction and then adding too much noise in the other uh, or correlation. Yeah, so yeah, I think, it's a compromise. I think that's, yeah, I think yeah. that's discussed in the paper, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. this is in Sean et al. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Okay, I see. Okay, uh, I think my last question is. You have shown uh, some uh, tension between the lensing lensing data. I, I think in the pretty much the last slide of your talk, uh, yes, sixteen, yes, and right. So the, this this green data seems to be lower than the others. Um, so lensing lensing would be sensitive to the total measure density, right? So does this mean the measurement prefer a lower value of of, of omega m? I don't know if we can make this inference from from the data. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm not about omega m. Uh, so oh. I think that for a less massive sample, so in order to to have the agreement, 
uh, the sample should that they yeah the, should be less massive. I'm not sure of yeah this is a particular sample. Of, yeah, I'm not sure of the impact on omega n. What 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 could it be? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's all. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Look forward to your follow up uh, email. Yeah. <laughs> thank yes, you. Yes. 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 No. Okay, um, well, I think we can call it then. And Stefania, well, good luck with your move. Um, you. yeah, and thanks again for agreeing to do this. And uh, thanks everyone for joining. And uh, next week we have uh, Ken Ganga, who is one of the participants today. So he's giving a talk next week. Um, I'll send you all the details soon. Okay, thank you again, Stefania. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much.